Good evening, everyone. My name is Journey, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, Up North, an Architecture World Trip with Josh Lipnick. Photif Photographer Josh Lipnick travels through small Midwest towns to find the marvelous facades, neon signs, elaborate Victorians, and architectural trends that time has left behind. In this presentation, he offers his evocative pictures from Northern Michigan to tell the story of immigrants, industry, and the role of local resources in geology while reflecting on his time on the road. Please take a moment to silence your devices. And if you need an assisted hearing device, we do have them back in the hallway. Um, let's give a warm welcome to Josh. All right, thank you everyone for coming out and also thank you to everyone at the library for um, helping me get this all set up. Um, I spent a lot of time at this library when I lived in Ann Arbor in college, so it's exciting to be back here giving a presentation. Um, so just to introduce myself a little bit, um, I'm Josh Lipnick. Uh, I have a Twitter account called Midwest Modern where I document architecture from around the Midwest. I've been all over Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, parts of Canada. Um, I studied architecture at U of M lived in Ann Arbor, then I studied landscape architecture at Ohio State, and since pretty much as long as I could drive, I've been driving all over Michigan, documenting architecture and uh, learning about different cities. So <clears throat> when Christopher invited me to speak here, we were talking about which part of Michigan would be the most interesting to cover. And I thought that up north would be a good one because people go up there to either go camping or fishing or go to the beach or go skiing, but um, people really aren't going up there as much to look at architecture and, and walk around the cities. So. I thought that it would be a good chance to maybe introduce people to some places and buildings that they might not otherwise know about from up there. So first question, where is up north? And the only thing that for this purposes of this presentation that it's not would be the Upper Peninsula. That has its own history and culture and um, geography that Maybe, uh, maybe another time I can come back and talk about that. But as far as where is up north, the disappointing answer is that there isn't really one definition. And it's going to depend where you live. So if you grew up in Detroit, you're going to have a different perception as someone who grew up in Grand Rapids or that's from Flint or Saginaw. So it's kind of up in the air where is up north. but. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going with this, which also happens to be the Diocese of Gaylord for the Catholic Church, but that's sort of just a coincidence. It's uh, just a convenient cutoff. So here's sort of the overview of the road trip. And to be transparent, this was more like two or three road trips that have been combined into one. but. Starting out in West Branch and kind of circling around to the west coast of Michigan and all the way around the top of the mitten there. So I'm breaking it up into two legs so that we can kind of orient ourselves and, and not get too lost. So this first leg, we're starting off in West Branch, going through Cadillac, out to Manistee on Lake Michigan up through Frankfurt, Glen Arbor, um, around the Leelanau Peninsula, through Leland, the uh, Grand Traverse Reservation, and into Traverse City. And then um, we'll check in again about halfway through and uh, look at the second leg. So I said that everyone has their own definition of where up north starts. And for me, this is the spot, this lumberjack. So this is Lumberjack Restaurant in West Branch. 
Also in West Branch, this is the Mich Michigan Central Depot. Um, it was built one year after the town was founded. Really quaint, simple, Victorian Gothic train station. And this was mostly used for bringing settlers up to the city and um, logging supplies. Timber was overwhelmingly the number one business of this whole region, so that will come up again and again. So over to Cadillac, Michigan. Um, Cadillac was another huge lumber town. Um, starting in the 1870s, going through to the 1890s, which is around the time that the lumber boom ended. So you can see here um, some of the products that were made in Cadillac. So after the lumber boom ended, all these towns had to sort of convert to these smaller industries. So instead of just sawmills that were processing lumber, they'd start producing stuff like hardwood flooring, some furniture, and even some smaller industries like iron and, and that type of thing. This is in Cadillac, the former offices of Cobbs and Mitchell. They were one of the biggest lum lumber companies in the area. Uh, the Mitchell family actually were one of the founding families of Cadillac, so they owned huge swaths of land for timber in the area. But once the timber boom ended, they converted the business to making uh, luxury wood items, mostly hardwood flooring, and this was their showroom. So it was designed by the Detroit architect, George Mason. He was known as the Dean of Detroit Architects. He designed the Masonic Temple in Detroit and tons of other buildings. Um, but he designed this elaborate showroom for uh, Cobbs and Mitchell, and they would have builders and architects coming from all across the Great Lakes to look at their products here. Here's uh, another detail of the Cobbs and Mitchell building. You can see the leaded glass and, and just get an idea of, for a small building, the level of detail that went into this. So keeping going west over to Manistee. This is the Manistee Fire Hall. And this has the Guinness Book of World Records for being the oldest continuously operating fire hall in the country. So it's been continuously operated since 1888. Um, and to get that Guinness certification, they had to show their records that for the last, what is it, 140 years, there's been someone working in the building continuously. Now, there might be some other that are older and just don't have the records to prove it, but until they do, uh, Manistee gets to keep that title. The Guardian Angel Church in Manistee, one of the most impressive churches in the whole region of northern Michigan. It was originally founded by German Catholics who broke off from the original Catholic church in town along with the Polish Catholics. There was some conflict between the two groups, so they both broke apart and started their own churches. And they hired the Chicago architect Adolphus Druding to design it. He was born in Germany, and he designed German Catholic churches all across the country, from Chicago to the East Coast. And um, he was one of the most prominent Catholic church designers of his day. So <clears throat> it's got the form of a Gothic church, but it also incorporates elements like these round arches, which were popular in Germany at the time. So it was drawing on these German influences. You can see here more of that beautiful brickwork. Um, I think there was something like 60,000 bricks that were used to build this. Also in Manistee, a much more modern church. The St. Mary of Mount Carmel Shrine, built in 1962 and designed by James H. Livingston, who was uh, an architect based out of Ann Arbor. And 
you can see here in this old photograph, the, the front has been altered pretty significantly and it's starting to show some signs of aging. And the last service was actually held here in 2018. So ironically, after these Catholic churches sort of broke up back in the day with these ethnic tensions, they all had to come together in the last five years and uh, form one united church again. <clears throat> so here's an old photo of the interior. Um, I wasn't able to get inside. I assume that most of this has been changed and, and not kept in place. Another photo from the side. The form of the church was supposed to be the shape of praying hands. And then this is actually James Livingston's office here in Ann Arbor. It's up on um, uh, Washtenaw and here on Parkway. So he built this office in 1972 and passed away the next year, so barely got to use this office. So going up north from Manistee to the small town of Kaliva, Michigan, which was founded by immigrants from Finland, and really small town. The name itself comes from the Kalevala. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's the national epic of Finland. And the person who built this house, John J. McKinnon, um, he was also an immigrant from Finland, moved to Kaliva, and he opened up a company called the Northwest Bottling Works. So they decided to build this house using bottles as the material for the wall. You can see here, there are all different colors of bottles that they produce at his factory. And according to the museum, which is now, um, the house is now used for a museum. According to them, the term pop for, you know, what we call pop actually came from the Northwest Bottling Company because they would originally cork the bottles and so that would pop. That could be apocryphal, I, I don't know, but that's what they claim. Um, going a little further north into cherry country, got the Cherry Bowl Drive-In in Honor, Michigan. Opened in 1953, one of, I think, seven drive-in theaters left in Michigan and the last one that's still operating in northern Michigan. So people come from all around to see movies here from all over the region. Cherry Bowl, a beautiful cherry cow. And just down the road from there in Beulah, the Cherry Hut. More cherries, you can get cherry pie, um, cherry jam, all types of good stuff here. So now moving on to Frankfurt, Michigan, back along the coast. Um, this is Leelanau Street, so that was sort of the grand wealthy street of Frankfurt. So you have houses like this, the A.G. Butler house, a little bit older, Gothic, uh, Victorian Gothic. And these originally looked over Lake Michigan, but later houses were built sort of blocking their view. Cherry Republic, um, <laughs> nothing super exciting architecturally, but just kind of a, an important place in northern Michigan. <clears throat> this is the D.H. Day Farm, a.k.a. Oswagachi, named after the town that D.H. Day came from in New York. This is basically right in the shadow of the Sleeping Bear Dunes, and it's sort of set apart from the hundreds or thousands of other barns in Michigan with the shape of the roof. It's called a OG roof. So it's kind of rounded with a little tip at the top. And it's also got some interesting octagonal uh, towers. So now up in Leland, Michigan, this is Fishtown. Fishtown is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, surviving fishing village on the Great Lakes. 
and it's mostly been converted now to sort of touristy shops, little restaurants. You can see here a cheese shop. Um, there's a candy store. Um, these little wood buildings, really simple architecture for, you know, sort of a utilitarian type of town. Sandwiches. <laughs> More of these. And there actually are still uh, fishing uses of the village. There's Carlson's Fishery, which has been around since 1904. And they're still... Um, continue to operate in Fishtown. So Falling Waters Lodge is the only new building in Fishtown, and this is another Ann Arbor architect, Roger Hummel. He built this almost immediately after he graduated from the architecture school here at U of M. And as far as I know, this is the only thing he ever designed. Um, <laughs> There's not much else I could find on him, but um, kind of a, a strange building, but a really cool location right on the canal there. Yeah, you're, you're really right on the water when you're staying at this hotel. <clears throat> so across the Leelanau Peninsula, we have the Grand Traverse Reservation of the Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. And this here is their civic center, the Strongheart Civic Center. It was designed by the Canadian architect, Douglas Cardinal, who's one of the most prominent indigenous architects in North America. He designed the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC, as well as tons of buildings in Canada. Um, <clears throat> the design for this was drawn from the shape of a turtle, which has a lot of importance to the Ottawa and Chippewa tribes. Um, it's supposed to represent strength and endurance and luck to their, tr to their tradition. So Cardinal drew on that. You can see here, really a beautiful site, sort of like a little bowl in between these hills. More here. You can see some really nice shadows from the um, form of the roof there. So going down into Traverse City now, look at just a few houses in Traverse City. So this is an interesting one, just this absurdly tall tower sticking out. And um, I don't know if you can really see, but there's a sort of creepy mannequin lurking in that tower. Um, another beautiful Victorian house. This is now a funeral home, um, but just a massive, massive house. Another sort of odd one with this rounded corner here, this little turret. And then some nice mid-century modern houses in Traverse City. So the State Theater in Traverse City, which is recognized as the greatest movie theater in America by the Motion Picture Association, it was originally built in 1916. It burned down in the 1920s. They rebuilt it. It burned down again in the 1940s. <laughs> And they rebuilt it again in this really striking, modern, um, sort of the border between Art Deco and modern styles. Um, the bright red panels still has the really nice original uh, marquee from the theater. Here at night, you can see it lit up. And the theater actually closed in 1996, and then it was reopened in uh, 2007 um, to become home of the Traverse City Film Festival, um, which Michael Moore started up there, and he was very involved in, in renovating and getting this theater back open. So another theater in Traverse City, this is actually a new one, 
that opened, I believe, in 2013 because the state theater was barred from showing um, certain movies contractually. So they opened up a new theater. And originally, this building was the Con Foster Museum. So you can see here, Con Foster was at one point the mayor of Traverse City and before that, the parks commissioner. He was also a, <clears throat> a huge collector of indigenous artifacts. So while he was the park commissioner in the 1930s, he talked to some people at the federal government and got the uh, Works Progress Administration to use New Deal funds to build a museum to house all his collection. Um, so after it was converted to a movie theater, recently the, um, the collection has been moved to a new building for the Traverse City City Museum. The Okerstrom Fine Arts Building at Northwest Michigan College, which is the community college in Traverse City, um, this is an important building because it was the last building designed by the German Bauhaus architect Walter Gropius. Um, it was designed by his firm, the Architects Collaborative, which he formed with some of his students at Harvard. And he actually passed away before this was completed. So he wasn't listed as the architect of record, but um, it's agreed upon that this is the last building he worked on. So the form was inspired by cubism and other abstract art styles. You can see all types of interesting angles. It was originally supposed to be built out of concrete, but they decided that wood would be a more appropriate material for this area. You can see it's kind of in this little hidden um, oasis in the woods there. It's really an interesting building for a community college, kind of its own little world on the campus. More of these strong forms. This is one of the studios, art studios, and here you can see inside the studio. And then just inside these sort of warm, cozy spaces to sit inside the building. Also in Traverse City, some unique gas stations. These mutual service stations were built in the 1950s. It's a local chain and still going, hasn't been taken over by Shell or BP or the other ones. <clears throat> you can see here that interesting butterfly roof. Another one with just the one uh, swooping roof. Now, this is Randy's Old Town Auto Service in Traverse City in the Old Town neighborhood. Um, just a really beautiful Art Deco building that, you know, there's no need to build something like this to fix tires and, and grease wheels and all that, but um, they really went all out with this building. Some beautiful mint green and gold and black uh, terracotta. Here, at some point, it was um, part of a mobile station. You can see that faded sign. More of that really interesting Art Deco detail here. So yeah, I, I just love this one because it's such a utilitarian building that <clears throat> they really just went above and beyond with. Outside of Traverse City, going east to Acme, Doug Murdoch's Fudge. Um, obviously, Fudge is a huge part of the food culture in this part of Michigan, and um, they put it right up on their roof. Big piece of Fudge there. So, all right, so that was the first half got through Traverse City. So for the second half, we're gonna start in Elk Rapids, go down to Kalkaska, back up to 
east to Jordan on um, Lake Charlevoix, then to Charlevoix, Petoskey, um, across to the other side of the mitten to Sheboygan, down to Rogers City, and then we'll end around Alpena and Ossinique. So another Art Deco movie theater, the Elk Rapids Cinema. Um, really interesting with this glass block tower, designed by architect Louis Kingscott, who was based out of Kalamazoo. And um, you can see here more of that glass block tower. And this one still has a lot of the original interior, so you can see the ticket booth here and for some reason a harmonica um, display. I don't know if they sell them or what, what that's about, but interesting. The lighting, uh, interesting Art Deco style lighting. That was actually built by the owner of the theater, Edwin Loomis who ran the theater, I believe, until at least the 1960s. And the theater is still showing movies today and has been since it opened in 1940. So not many of these original Art Deco theaters left in, in some of these small towns. So they're lucky to still have this one. Over in Kalkaska, we have the National Trout Memorial. Um, so the, the, one of the big differences between the inland and the um, cities on the shore up there, the inland cities are much more tourist focused around hunting and fishing and it's more recreational and beach stuff on the uh, coast there. So Kalkaska, really important city for the fishing tourism up there. And every April they have the National Trout Festival in Kalkaska as well. So you can go there and pay your specs to this big trout. Um, I don't know why they called a memorial, but. <laughs> so up in East Jordan, really small town with this great big factory, which is the East Jordan Ironworks. Now the company is currently called EJ, They've sort of reformed over the years. They were formed in the 1880s and have been operating since then, making various iron products. You can see here on Lake Charlevoix, a very scenic uh, location for this factory. Now, what East Jordan Iron Works is most known for are these manhole covers. <clears throat> so that now you know where all these manhole covers come from. That is their primary business now, has been for probably at least 70, 80 years. And they actually now have foundries in Europe. Um, I believe there's one in Asia. So yeah, they've just been making these uh, manhole covers for about 100 years now and keep growing. Outside of East Jordan, there's this interesting little fieldstone church called St. John Nepomucene Catholic Church. And <clears throat> it was founded by immigrants from the Czech Republic. At the time, it wasn't called that, but the modern day Czech Republic. And St. John Nepomucene is the patron saint of Czechs and Slovaks. So they moved from the area around Prague to this very rural area of northern Michigan, and they named their town Praga. That isn't the official name of the town anymore. It's, it's been absorbed into some type of township, but um, historically this was an area where um, people settled from the Czech Republic. More here, you can see this. Um, nicely carved door. The church actually wasn't originally built in fieldstone. Um, the fieldstone was added in the 1920s. So as far as I know, we don't have any photos of what that original church looked like. 
So here, moving up to Charlevoix, we've got the Bluebell Cottage. Really unique um, Carpenter Gothic style house. And here's an old photo of it. This was originally part of the Belvedere Club, which was one of the first summer resorts in that area. Uh, I believe it was found, yeah, it was found by Baptist congregation from Kalamazoo. There's another club nearby called the Chicago Club that was founded by wealthy people from Chicago. So through the 1870s and 1880s, Charlevoix really became the destination in northern Michigan for the wealthiest tourists from Chicago, from Grand Rapids, from Detroit, from Kalamazoo, and all across the Midwest. Here's another photo of the uh, Belvedere Club. So you can see in the background just all types of interesting Gothic, Victorian, all types of eclectic styles of mansions that were built in this club. And unfortunately, a lot of these clubs now are, are blocked off and private, so um, wasn't able to explore too much of it, but again, this one is still on a public street, so this is sort of the representative for the rest of the Belvedere Club. The Chicago and West Michigan Depot in Charlevoix was built in 1892, shingle-style building, it was built by Pelton and Company out of Grand Rapids. And the Chicago and West Michigan Railroad ran from Chicago up West Michigan to Traverse City. By the 1890s, they expanded the railroad to Charlevoix and eventually to Petoskey to accommodate the tourists. Unlike a lot of the old railroads in the region, which were used more for um, transporting materials and, and supplies. This was always primarily for tourists to the region. More here, that shingle style turret and the old train sign still there. <clears throat> now in Charlevoix, one of the big draws and, and they have tours to see all these, which I would really recommend that the tours are really great. They take you around on a little golf cart. Um, so Charlevoix has these really unique houses that were built by a local builder named Earl A. Young. <clears throat> he was not trained as an architect. He was just a builder and he specialized in building with stone. So he would um, find all his own stone out in Lake Michigan, in the woods, looking all over the place. He'd, he'd pick out, hand pick all the stones for his building. This one is known as the Thatch House. There's really, I mean, nothing, nothing like this house anywhere else up there. Um, this was built, I believe, in the 1940s, and it has recently become a very expensive Airbnb, so <laughs> you can um, now stay here. This is another early young house next door called the Half House, built in 1947. Young actually built this for his own family. He owned two adjoining properties and he wanted to build a house that would span both sides of the property, but the city wouldn't let him. They said, you have to build just on one lot. So he just cut the house in half and, and cut it off at the lot line. Um, I think it was probably a little bit like a middle finger to the city that wouldn't let him get his way. <clears throat> But his houses are usually referred to as the mushroom houses, and you can see why, sort of a little bit of a hobbit thing going on. This is a later one of his houses where he had started to be more influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright and the prairie style, but you can see he still had his own signature touch with, with this very handmade <clears throat> quality of the stonework in all of his buildings. Another one of his mushroom houses another, with another one of his signature features, which is this faux snow-capped chimney. 
very whimsical, and um, he didn't only do mushroom houses. He also did um, this house, which is more like a Swiss chalet style. But you can still see that um, hand-picked stonework with the <clears throat> the specimen rocks snuck into the stone wall there. You can see a better view of it here. This is a retaining wall that goes along the side of the house here. So, yeah, every every stone wall, all the little details were all handpicked. And he didn't just do houses. He would even take small commissions like this to just do a retaining wall or this old house where he was commissioned just to add some detail to the balcony here. So um, aside from houses, this is probably his most well-known building, the Weather Vane Restaurant. Really nice restaurant on the... Um, river that goes out to Lake Michigan there. You can see here more of that great stonework. And then inside, all, um, all again, hand-picked stone. You can see this curving wall. Incredible attention to detail in all his projects. But the star of the Weather Vane restaurant is this giant fireplace. Again, these stones were uh, dragged out of Lake Michigan. Um, I'm sure he went through tons of them to find this um, perfectly veined specimen stone to set over the fireplace. And these stones were actually so heavy that the building had to be reinforced with extra pylons underneath because these stones were just weighing through the foundation of the building. And, um, you know, I don't have it here, but there's a photo of Earl Young standing next to this fireplace, and you can tell he's, he was about five foot two or five foot three. So, tiny little man carrying around, dragging around these giant stones. The Bayview Summer Resort, just outside of Petoskey, Michigan. This is another one of these um, early summer resorts in the region. This one was found by a Methodist group, <clears throat> and they originally found it to be part of the Chautauqua movement, which were these series of lectures that people would go around the country giving lectures on literature and science and, and trying to cultivate these intellectual pursuits. And this became sort of a center of that movement in northern Michigan. So they had little libraries, um, uh, little lecture halls, and then there are about 400 houses that are part of Bayview. Um, so Again, from that 1870s, 1880s era with these really eclectic Victorians. This one's one of the most unusual with that um, big raised balcony up there. Some smaller little Gothic cottages. Again, here an interesting octagonal house with some really beautiful... Um, woodwork around the roof. And then I uh, should mention one controversy that surrounded Bayview is that until recently they explicitly only allowed white Christians to buy property in the air in the um, you know it's like a homeowners association basically and they were sued and I believe within the last two years, they finally had to open up a membership to everyone, you know, which is pretty crazy for 2019 about when that happened. In Petoskey, former J.C. Penney, this one opened in 1926 and it closed in 2019. Um, 
But this was one of the last small town locations that J.C. Penney had. Originally, you know, back in the 1920s, almost every small town had either a J.C. Penney or a Woolworths or some type of department store. But this was one of the very last ones, and I believe that the entire company has gone out of business now. So um, this is now being redeveloped into some other type of commercial building. In Sheboygan, Michigan, uh, seemingly out of place Mission Revival style church. <laughs> You would expect to see something like this more in, you know, Texas or New Mexico or Arizona. Um, has all the features, the scalloped roof line, the campanile, the red tile roof. Let's see here, more of that detail. And um, yeah, I just think this is interesting because of how out of place it seems in northern Michigan. Um, but I think that makes it cool and interesting. And um, you'll see the next one, another seemingly out of place building. This is like more of a Miami Art Deco style post office in Rogers City, Michigan. Um, this was designed by Louis A. Simon, who was the architect for the Treasury Department which oversaw post office construction all around the country. So technically this was not part of the New Deal, but it's sort of lumped in with that era because um, you know, similar styles and, and um, so you can see here, this sort of streamlined style <coughs> railing some interesting ornament uh, around the windows. Now, this here is the world's largest limestone quarry. It's located just outside of Rogers City, Michigan. It was first, uh, the quarry opened in 1912 and has been continuously operating since then. And they're still digging limestone out of here. You can see just how massive the scale of this is, that parts of it are even being um, rewilded and, and returning to their um, natural state to in some of the older parts of the quarry. So <clears throat> the limestone here was primarily not used for building materials. It was used more for industrial um, and chemical purposes. So um, uh, made into cement, concrete, um, and then all types of chemicals that use lime. But it's the concrete that is important to remember as we go to the next city, which is Alpina. Now, Alpina is surprisingly a very important part of the history of modernist architecture in America. So with all the limestone and cement industry around the region, a man named Jesse Besser, who was an inventor, an entrepreneur, manufacturer, he decided to make concrete block. And this is a picture of him with the first concrete block machine that he invented. <clears throat> and this would later grow to become the largest manufacturer of concrete block in the country and remains to this day the largest. Here's an, some examples of some of the products they made. So you've probably seen these all over the place, the breeze block very popular in the 50s and 60s. Now these, the best stone split block houses, were built to show off some of the products of the Besser Company. This is actually um, concrete bricks that are faced to look like um, natural stone. And it was just a, an employee at the company who drew up the plans for these. 
and built these interesting little bungalows. They were built in 1924, so pretty ahead of their time. There, there really wasn't anything like this getting built in that era, especially in Alpena. Um, those gargoyles on the top were added later. That is, a, a, the current owner added that nice little touch. So the Besser company did a lot of experiments with housing in Alpena <clears throat> to show off their products. So we'll, we'll look at a few other buildings that use the Besser blocks. This is the house of Jesse Besser and his wife Anna. Um, built in 1939 and designed by the architect Joseph Godine of Bay City. Um, <clears throat> it uses a pink tinted block. So this was a way for them to show off the different possibilities with color and concrete block. And it's got a pretty modern design for 1939. Um, definitely influenced by some of the early modernist houses in California, like um, Richard Neutra and, and Rudolf Schindler, and some of those other early modernists, especially the corner windows, a real notable feature of that early modernist design. Here, more of the Besser house. Um, also a copper roof there. You can see here more of those corner windows around the back. Now this was also built with money from the Besser family. This is the Besser Museum of Northeast Michigan. Um, it, the collection is mainly indigenous and early settler artifacts from the area and also local history. So it's a pretty interesting museum and also has some of the history of the Besser Company and its um, glass or er, concrete block. You can see here some more examples of the concrete block are used in this building. It was designed by the firm Spence and Smith, based out of Saginaw. And around the back of the museum, more examples of the concrete block. It's just all over the place in Alpena. Here is the Besser Technical Center at um, Alpena Community College. This was donated by the Besser Company again because they wanted to basically create a pipeline for students with technical knowledge that could come work for the Besser Company. So this uses another type of block. This one is more um, meant to look like natural stone. And then it's got that uh, really cool mid-century folded plate roof. Inside here, really beautiful light fixtures. They've really done a good job keeping the um, <clears throat> original design features of the building, which a lot of community colleges have not been that good about that. And yeah, more here. Really, you can see too, more examples of different texture and sizes of the concrete blocks. So again, the whole city is, is kind of like a showroom for the Besser manufacturing products. But Alpena doesn't just have the concrete block, they also have some beautiful 19th century commercial architecture in the downtown. The State Theater here, uh, originally opened as an opera house, later converted to a movie theater in the 1930s. The Alpena County Courthouse, another interesting Art Deco building. This was designed by William H. Cooney, an architect from Detroit, and he designed a nearly identical courthouse in Tuscola County in the Thumb of Michigan, uh, in, I believe it's Cairo, Michigan. So Alpena and Cairo have these, oddly have these um, twin courthouses. More here, the Alpena County Courthouse, the um, Art Deco style clock on the top. 
so getting towards the end here, but the prehistorical gardens are just south of Alpina, and it's sort of one of the big, kitschy, old-timey tourist attractions on the east side of northern Michigan. It was built by a man named Paul N. Domke, and it opened in 1935. He was sort of a self-taught artist, and he decided one day that uh, Michigan could use a fake dinosaur zoo <laughs> and took it upon himself to build it. So basically these trails just going all through the woods, different dinosaurs he built. Um, you can see here some, some very weird depictions of, of cavemen. Um, I think probably the uh, timelines here and just the accuracy of all of these. I'm, I'm guessing we're not really on, but um, definitely an interesting guy who, um, you know, just decided there was something he wanted to do and he built it. More of these. Now, gonna end the way we started. Another lumberjack. This was also built by Paul Domke, who did the dinosaur gardens. Um, Paul Bunyan and his big blue ox. And um, yeah, I think ending with a lumberjack and starting with a lumberjack is uh, a good way to wrap it up. So um, yeah, that's the end of my talk. And if, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer a few questions. Yes, you know, I did see the, the theaters. Um, unfortunately, you know, I had to cut some stuff out. I couldn't put everything in there. The Vogue is a beautiful theater, and so is the Ramsell. I didn't really get to see many houses while I was in Well, is it, you Manistee? know, it's called the Victorian Port City. Ah. There's a lot of beautiful homes up that hill. If you go up the hill where the theater is and the hotel, which used oh. to be a bank, and I've stayed there a bunch of times. Oh, interesting. But it's a big lumbering. Those homes are all built by lumber guys. Ah, OK. Very cool. I'll have to check that out next time I'm up that way. And the Terrace Inn in, um, just above uh, Harbor Springs, between Harbor Springs and the Tennessee. Mm. In that neighborhood that you were in, where people, I don't know if they still came to live in there in the winter. Hmm. They buy those homes, but they're closed up and they have to leave in the winter. They build two. Ah, interesting. Hi. Um, Hi, thank you for coming and speaking with us. Mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate it. I'm wondering if you have a favorite spot out of all of these, or a favorite spot in northern Michigan that you're <coughs> willing to share with us to find some cool um, architecture. Let me think. So a favorite spot to find architecture up there? Um, I think Charlevoix is really interesting with the mushroom houses. Um, Fishtown in Leland, I just think is really cool. Even though it's sort of become a touristy spot, I still think that's a really interesting place to visit. Um, I actually have been recommending people to check out more of the east side of northern Michigan, so Alpena and Rogers City. I think most of the tourism is the area around Traverse City on the other side, but there's some really beautiful beaches and, and sand dunes on the other side of uh, northern Michigan, too. And Alpena is a pretty nice little town. So I definitely would recommend, if, if you've never been to that side of the state, to check out that area. Awesome. Hi, Josh. Um, hey. 
Love your Twitter account, by the way. Fantastic content. Thank you. I was wondering, um, what does your process look like for going about this? Are you like, do you look up the cities before? Are you just driving around and clicking photos? So it really depends on what the size of the town is. So Traverse City, I, you know, will do a little research before. Um, I'll look at the National Register of Historic Places to get ideas for buildings to see. Um, there's a few, um, the Society of Architectural Historians usually has good listing for every city. So I'll kind of start there with these lists that are already laid out and then um, start searching myself on Google Maps and, and look for interesting things that way. So usually when I go into a city that size, I'll have a little bit of a list of what I'm looking for and then um, I'll sort of just explore and, and find new things that I didn't know about. So definitely for bigger cities, I go in with like half I have already mapped out. I know what I want to see and the other half I'm sort of figuring out as I go along and, and finding things that are new to me. If it's a really small town, like a um, place like Glen Arbor or, um, or Elk Rapids, usually a place like that, I'll just go walk around. It's small enough where if there's something interesting to see, you'll probably just see it walking around. Um, yeah, so it, it is kind of a little different wherever I go. Um, some places there's more local sources, like the city will have list, their own historic listings. Um, yeah, there, there isn't really one, th one way I go about it. I, I sort of look at a bunch of different sources. We have time for one more question, so I'm going to pass it off here. So glad to end this. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, um, I don't, I don't mean it. That came out the wrong way. I apologize. It's okay. Um, uh, Josh, so I follow you on Twitter, and you like go and you take these amazing places all over the Midwest, Canada now. Like, how do you do this? What is your life? Like, I actually, you know what, I really don't travel very much. Like, maybe once every couple months I'll go on a little road trip, just Sometimes I'm not even staying overnight. I'll just kind of drive up north. And um, yeah, I, I really have gotten good at traveling cheap. And I've always kind of been that way because I like to travel. But, you know, when I was younger, I didn't really have any money. So I, I got over the years really good at traveling cheap. And um, I think the fact that I have sort of a, on my Twitter, like there's a continuous, it, it makes it seem like I'm constantly on the road, I know. <laughs> but like, for instance, when I went to Cincinnati recently, <clears throat> I was there for four days and it was like almost three or four months worth of, of photos that I shared from there. So if I do it right, I can kind of ring like, a, a few months of content out of out of a trip um, so I, I think I've I've sort of just gotten good at, at traveling cheaply and efficiently and yeah all right well thank you very much thank you Don't forget to attend any of our other events coming up. Um, we have several talks lined up. You can check our pamphlets and brochures back in the hallway. Thanks for coming.